but just as middle the baklavas of wisdom. Uh, I think we're all a little confused about whether we're standing on the edge of Arabia or feeling the magic of Persia. Whoa. I've been wanting to make those jokes for years. <laughs> uh, this panel uh, is on the subject of careering. Do careers only make sense looking backwards or forwards? Did you go to art school before you became an internationally acclaimed rock star or best-selling author? Did your career have a plan? Can you have a career without having a job? If there are no more jobs for life, are there just careers for today? What career advice would you give? So we've convened these four gentlemen who each in their own respect uh, both needs no introduction and also uh, has stories to tell. So I will very briefly uh, tell you who is here. Uh, Hans Ulrich Obrist is the director of the Serpentine Gallery in London and a writer and curator, also known just by Huo. He is a one-man definition machine of all kinds. We have Shimon Basar, the Global Art Forum Commissioner, or as he is known in Turkey, Shimon Bashar. Douglas Copeland is a writer and artist and we will be delving into his biography in this forum, so I will not tell you too much more. And then Mr. Michael Stipe is the former uh, lead singer of a band that I called Rem until I was 12 years old and is now an artist, and we're gonna be hearing about Michael and Doug's careers. Thank you, please give them a big welcome. Hi, am I on? Okay, great. Hi, thank you. Um, welcome, all of you. Uh, so, careering. The word career may not mean what it did 20 or 30 years ago. Specialization has often given way to collage careers, portfolio careers, careers that confuse parents, careers that don't even know the meaning of the word career. Seen from a particular vantage point, careers are design projects. They have shape, narrativity, possible predestination, i.e., what did your parents do? and also serendipitous failure built into their wiring. You might be a child star age six, and by age nine, no one knows your name, not even your agent stroke mother. Your name might be Haruki Murakami, and before you became a famous novelist, you ran a successful bar with your wife. Your, your name might be James Franco, in which case everything is happening at the same time. You're an actor, an artist, you're a PhD candidate, a visiting professor, you're a poet, and no, no one knows whether you're for real or just a real wannabe. Your name may have been Muammar Gaddafi, and after 40 year, 42 years of absolute job security, not only has your career come to a complete impotent halt, but the phrase, you're fired, takes on a mortal, literal, and decisive dimension. Many of you in this room may be pre-career. Do you know the course that you're going to take? Is it important to know? Can you really control it? Many of you may be mid-career. Has it turned out how you imagined? Is destiny still something ahead of you? Are any of you post-career? If so, I'm deeply jealous. I want to be you. Careering, to lose control and veer into uncharted territory. We are careering today with... Um, each of our guests have... Uh, Wikipedia pages, of course, so that means that they're real. <laughs> they're, not, they're not holograms um, projected on the stage. Um, this is Douglas Copeland's uh, Wikipedia page, which interestingly uh, tells us how to pronounce Copeland. <laughs> Why Wikipedia always has the most profoundly unflattering photographs on your... <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I look like. <laughs> Was that during your janitor period? <laughs> um, and this is Michael Stipe's uh, Wikipedia page. Um, nice cold day there, Michael. <laughs> Chilly. Um, I like this. Stipe is noted and occasionally parodied for the mumbling style of, his, uh, style of his early career, as well as his social and political activism. He's been accusing both of us of mumbling. <laughs> Uh, the last day. You, you have been. <laughs> it's terrible. It was a homage. And <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it's appreciated. And this is uh, Hans Ulrich's um, Wikipedia page. And Hans is sitting in front of some cardboard boxes. 
which will tie in very beautifully to the end, which I'm not going to give away, but it's a beautiful circle. Uh, so uh, that's proof that our guests this evening are real characters. And now over to Hans Ulrich, who has a few things to say. Yes, Ramon, thank you so much. And thanks to Antonia for this ongoing uh, Dubai miracle of these uh, conversations. Uh, and actually, uh, I was very kind of excited when Schumann sent us these emails a couple of months ago uh, about this idea of this neologism, because it reminded me of how we actually met uh, really in connection to Cedric Price, the great uh, English urbanist and architect who uh, invented such concepts as the Farm Palace. Uh, and he always sort of towards the end of his life says we need neologisms. He, as an urbanist, he was really fed up with his word city. And he said we can't really use this word city anymore. He wants us to come up with new words. So I think this whole idea of conferences kind of reintroducing neologisms. When Truman mentioned it for the first time, to me this kind of idea actually of this verb sort of involving maybe moving or uh, swerving between and across things, pinballing or careering from one thing to the next without a roadmap or a specific kind of plan or master plan, maybe a kind of a post-planning condition or something like that. I was thinking of David Deutsch, and I was kind of thinking what quantum physics uh, have actually come up with uh, in this visionary book David Deutsch wrote, Fabric of Reality, my favorite science book of the last year, where he basically said it's all about parallel realities. And I think in some kind of way, I was also thinking this morning when I came for the first time, one of the first times to Dubai Art Fair, I saw a great performance by the artist, visual artist Sofia Almaria, a couple of weeks ago, I saw at JFK Airport her best-selling novel. Uh, so here we are with parallel realities, which I think is so essential. And then I just wanted to say, um, uh, maybe Duramat always said everything twice. We should say everything twice. And actually, as Michael Stipe taught us when we had the Serpentine Marathon, if it's also like a reunion here, because we all had met uh, in October, uh, he called his contribution Michael Stipe, Michael Stipe, Michael Stipe. So today we could say everything three times. So it's very, very exciting to be here with Shumon Bazaar, Shumon Bazaar, <laughs> Douglas Copeland, Douglas Copeland, Douglas Copeland, Michael Stipe, Michael Stipe, Michael Stipe. <laughs> Thank you, Hans Ulrich, Hans Ulrich, Hans Ulrich. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what we're going to do, we're going to kind of take a, a careering, careening path through our uh, guests' uh, lives. Um, so in a way, it does uh, uh, call upon inevitably uh, the, the, the topic of biography that was insinuated uh, a, a short while ago and, um, and there are there are uh, there are very um, interesting parallels um, between both Doug's and Michael's lives and their careers and um, so we want to explore uh, these kind of o the uh, synchronicities the overlaps also where they kind of digress and in a sense where they come back together again and um, so maybe the first question to ask you both is, uh, Doug, you once described yourself as a military brat. And you said oh, that Michael was as well, perhaps. Um, could, you, could you say something about where you were bo both born, the circumstances of your respective births? Um, I was born on the Canadian Air Force Base in Baden-Baden, Germany. And uh, then my dad went civilian in the 67 and we moved to Vancouver, Canada. And I was born on an army base in Atlanta, Georgia. My father was a career uh, helicopter pilot. My dad was a pilot too, that's kind of scary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. Um, fast, fast forwarding somewhat, you um, both then go to um, art school in different cities, different countries. Um, could you say something about um, the decisions or the kind of criteria that you uh, had in making the decision to go to art school and, and tell us a little bit about the art schools that you both went to? Uh, I went to the Emily Carr University in Vancouver and I did one disastrous year studying science in Montreal and I realized I didn't want to spend my life working with carbon molecules and the new school had opened up and I thought, okay, that seems like a fit. And I was 1980, and by 1983, I realized I liked art school so much that I was gonna model the rest of my life after art school. So I graduated in 84, and anyone here, here who's been to art school and has graduated knows that those two or three years afterwards are kind of like the darkest and weirdest of your life, and then things got a bit better. So that was my brief experience. And I went to art school at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Uh, from the age of 19, and I, uh, I, I'm a, I, I am an art school dropout uh, because my band 
uh, became popular to the point that I was not able to continue my studies. So I made it through the senior year and then left. Um, my reason for choosing art school over, uh, over uh, any of the other departments is because uh, I was a punk rocker as a teenager and uh, that, was the, that was the place, art school was the place where all the kind of the island of misfit toys, uh, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the real uh, fringe uh, people uh, in this very small town kind of congregated around the art school and, and around the professors there. We've got um, a few images here of some of Doug's um, student work. That was, yeah, that was me during the five-year window where I was technically hot back in the <laughs> early 1980s. Nice tie. Thanks. <laughs> and um, that, that was obviously student work from second year. And then uh, go to the next one down there. Um, again, this, this skinny tie. I, I sort of came right out of the gate creating universes. And that seems to be what I, my brain wants to do. This is the show at the Vancouver Art Gallery in 87. Uh, and just taking various ideas and forms from design and art history and just making this dreamlike environment that you could enter and walk in and be a part of. And that if, was... So if we just go back a minute to, to, to this image, maybe you could say something, uh, it'd be interesting to know more about the the kind of broader context of the, edu of the art educations that you had, like what, what was in the air uh, at, at the time? Uh, was oh. that something that infused into both, both of your kind of careers? I know they were important individuals to, to both. Well, the, the, the hippie era was over. Punk was almost over. It was definitely a new wave era. And the PC revolution hadn't begun yet. So there was an amazing openness. Uh, and you could really do anything. You could still date your teachers. You could still <laughs> ask wildly inappropriate questions, and y you wouldn't get fired or kicked out or whatever. And uh, I think that was a nice, very, uh, really fertile environment to be able to learn to think inside of. Uh, there was one uh, professor, James Herbert, who taught drawing and painting, uh, of which I was mi I, the, the most miserable and pathetic painter and drawer, but, uh, but he is still one of the most charismatic people I've ever met and uh, had this ability to kind of take a room full of Play-Doh type, you know, 19 year olds and, and, and convince them that, that his way was, was the way to go. And his way was basically to do whatever, to follow your instinct and to do whatever it is that you want to do um, without questioning uh, your instinct. When I, um, when I asked you both if you could perhaps bring, if you happen to have images of, of work from that era, uh, Doug clearly did, Michael's response was, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I burnt it all. <laughs> yeah, I, true? I destroyed everything from uh, my art school days uh, because it was really bad. And I, I, <laughs> Can you I tell us in what way was it bad? Really awful, I mean awful. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a really terrible artist and I was even worse <laughs> when I was young. <laughs> Uh, the projects that I that I finished were were basically handed to me by teachers who were still teaching rabbit skin glue and you know egg tempera kind of stuff and it was really awful. Uh, I and I was thinking about this a lot because I didn't really know what what you know what came out of art school for me really in fact and I realized the only great early work that I produced was myself and I. <laughs> And I say that with, with my modesty firmly intact. <laughs> but I was a very unformed, uh, barely able to finish a sentence, uh, in, uh, like pathologically shy uh, uh, teenager. And uh, I, I, I found myself in this place where uh, the, the, pre the pressures of, of having to, uh, anyway, so I'll stop there because now I'm turning into that 19 year old again. But. <laughs> One thing which is kind of uh, maybe related to that is before, and we had coffee, we spoke about, you know, this notion, and you, Mike, spoke about this notion of the epiphany, you know, and I was asking you about chance, and, um, and obviously, you know, a lot has been written, and you spoke a lot about your epiphanies in, you know, in music, and Doug, a lot about the epiphanies in literature, but not so much is known about your epiphany in, you know, with art, and as you both started with art school, I was kind of wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about these early epiphanies, if there were, were such epiphanies, and what, what brought you to art. Art school the first time, or art as a, uh, later on in life? 
what brought me to art school. What, art school to start? But it was just where I was where all the freaks were, and uh, all the other people were kind of boring and uninteresting, and, and uh, all the kind of people that listened to the same music that I listened to and were interested in, that had green hair or whatever, went to the art school. It was also very close to downtown, so you could go hang out in the cafe and pretend to be very bohemian. And, uh, and everybody was kind of, you know, it was a very flirty, uh, very uh, social uh, experience. Uh, again, you know, the work, the work that came out of it was just pathetically bad. But, but I, I, did, I did form some lifelong friendships there, including James Herbert. And I think the, fir the, first, um, <clears throat> the first slide that you showed is, that's me uh, when I mumbled on the right with, with all the hair. And, and the glasses, and but this is a film that James Herbert actually, when when my band uh, signed a record deal and were making records, I, I went to him and said, I want you to make a film uh, of, of us, and he became so excited. Uh, it was meant to be a music video, three minutes long, and he got so excited with what he captured on film that he made a 25 minute uh, film, which we gave to MTV. They didn't know what to do with it, uh, so they chose the three minutes that they liked and called it a music video. Were you technically hot? Did I hot? answer the question at all? I don't think I did. Was I what? Were you technically hot? I, I was really hot, but I, I didn't know it. And, um, and that's, that's, that was part of the heat. <laughs> um, so that at this point, things do, uh, these parallel uh, routes maybe digress a little bit because, Doug, you completed your art school education um, and then th things happened. Um, you dropped out. How soon did you drop out? I was a senior. Yeah, so I, I made it through three and a half years. Three and a half years. Yeah. How much longer would you have needed to complete? Well, there were some really boring biology classes that I, <laughs> I had to take. And I, I flunked out of French uh, like three times because I had a mad crush on the teacher. and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't reckon with that. And some of the books survived. I heard rumors that actually a teacher against your will kind of didn't uh, yet sort of kept some of these works. Which, which works are these? There's, there's one piece that's been kept, and I've actually had conversations with her about it to say that if she ever, if she ever puts it online, or, or, or uh, that I'll come find her. It's really... <laughs> you know where she lives. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Doug, could you say something about... Um, so now we're in the, in the, in the 80s. Um, if we go back to your slides here. Um, it's significant, though, that I look at, uh, because I saw these yesterday with Doug, and I look at the work that you did as a 21-year-old, is that right? And, and it, it's really like the Ramones. You emerged complete into the world. This is exactly, exactly informs uh, the, the artist that you are now and have always been, and it's not that you're stuck in a rut or that you're doing the same thing over and over again, but you've, in fact, taken this, this uh, uh, language that you have and you've expanded and made universes out of it. I, on the other hand, was the exact opposite. Of that. No, 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 no. And no, we, I was. No, no. Okay, I am. I being a longtime fan, your album covers, all the stuff that came inside the albums, was so graphically self-consistent. It was well thought out, and right up into the 2000s. Um, I think you're shortchanging yourself. I think you really also did a Ramones and just came out boom with a very intact sensibility. And you know, I've known you pretty well over these years, and I can walk into a room and I know what you're probably going to take a photograph of. Or I'll see something like, oh, that's like a Michael moment. It's like a corner with a piece of gum or something. But it's like, I can still tell it's you. It's very, uh, just more concentrated and specific now. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to kind of track the, the, what, what sort of happens in your careers, even though they were, I, I think we'll probably conclude that they were not careers in any traditional sense. Uh, like, Doug, like Hans Ulrich said, um, it, they came with a certain amount of lack of planning, lack of direction. But, um, Michael, could you say something about um, how, if, and how uh, your art education or your art sensibility or interest in visual culture began to play a role in, uh, in the band in the early stages? Um, and I'm bringing up one of our favorite covers here. I like that. I, like, I, I actually like that photograph. Uh, I printed it. With, uh, at the time, I didn't know that um, you could hand ready-made uh, ready art to, uh, to the record company, and they would they would do whatever they needed to do to make it album size. So I printed the, the, the image uh, 12 by 12 because I thought I had to present them with the same size. Uh, and in order to do that, I had to stand on the kitchen counter with the printer and put the paper on the floor. So this is a, a, it's, 
it's actually kind of a beautiful. But I don't like the I don't like I don't like the next one and the one after the one after that, or the one after that. Uh, I, the one after that I do like. I didn't do that one. But what happened was I was the art student and Peter Buck, uh, our our very smart and very talkative uh, guitar player, said, "You're the art guy. You take care of all the visual stuff." And so I did that for 31 years. What, what, which album came after Murmur? Reckoning. Dead? Reckoning. Don't, please don't. <laughs> I have to. No. It's really, it's, it, it, I just cringe in horror at some of the choices that I made. That's really bad. Just take it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that was you? You do I don't that? want to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> if I could okay. go back and burn that, I would burn it. But uh, <laughs> the idea, the intention was pure. Uh, the, the the way the way that it was carried out was not. And this one? I don't like that one either. Okay, that's going away. Um, actually, this ties in quite nicely, maybe with uh, what happens in your career in the 80s, Doug. I mean, you move away from fine art, as it, as it were, actually, and then go to Japan, and there's an interest in design, magazine culture, graphic design. Could you say something about that shift? Well, I, I think Michael migrated to New York, and I migrated to Tokyo in Jap Japanese culture, and spent quite a few years there. I went to art school there, partially. Um, uh, I ended up in writing, I mean, it, it's a very, the, I was in Tokyo, I sent someone a postcard, they taped it on their fridge in Vancouver. A magazine or editor read that at a party, phoned me up and said, you should write. I'm like, writing? I'd never thought of writing, haha. -ha. And then two years later, I was writing fiction, that's when Gen X started. So, um, and I spent the next decade writing almost exclusively, but also was in charge of, in the end, everyone just assumed I did my book covers, so why not just do the covers? And then, uh, back in the 90s, when there was an internet with nowhere to go, we would, I did a website and, like, proto blogging and there was a visual sensibility there but it wasn't really in full operation it was in service to writing to come back to you know Mike's point about the epiphany was there a moment I mean I, I kind of um, remember always these conversations which I had with, with Albert Hoffman you know when he was sort of describing that very clear second almost when he you know discovered LSD or, you know, the conversation with Benoit Mandelbrot, where he describes the nanosecond when he saw for the first time fractals. And obviously, you know, without, it's maybe sometimes a more gradual process, but yet there, you know, are sometimes these moments, as Michael said before, of epiphany. So I was wondering, in terms of Generation X, if, you, if there was such a moment where there, you know, was an epiphany, or if it was a more gradual kind of process. Oh, well, when I wrote that book, that was the 89.90, and I was living in the desert in, in the Coachella Valley in California, and I really didn't think there was like 11 people on the entire planet who would read it or understand it. Maybe some people I went to high school with would understand it. And I felt fraudulent because I'd gotten this advance from St. Martin's Press to write it, which is 22,500, which isn't much now and it wasn't much back then, but it got me through. And when it came out and people connected to it, it was just, oh. Oh, in fact, the more interior something is, the more broad it, people actually like it. And I think that was that was the epiphany for me. It's like the more you go inside, the more it somehow goes outside. Michael, you agree? Yeah, I'm, I'm, the, the the big epiphanies in my life mostly center around Patti Smith, and the the first being uh, in 1975, she released her first album, Horses. I bought it the day it came out. Uh, I stayed up all night listening to it and went to school the next day knowing that I was going to dedicate my life to music and that that was, that was what I was going to do. I had no idea what that entailed. I didn't know that I had to write songs. I, 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 I didn't play an instrument. I wound up singing because I couldn't afford an instrument. Uh, and I found my voice as, as I went. Fast forward, uh, so from 1975, fast forward uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 20, year, 20 years into 1995, I meet Patty for the first time. Uh, she's coming out of uh, uh, kind of retirement from music. Uh, her husband has died, and she has to provide a living for her children. And she goes on the road uh, two years after that, in 1997, I think. Uh, Bob Dylan asks her to open for him for 12 shows. And she asked me if I want to come along, so I went. We had a day off in Philadelphia, and there was a Brancusi exhibit. And I didn't realize at the time, uh, Patty took me through the exhibit and she knew much more about him than I did. 
uh, and she, I think, had a secret crush on Noguchi, who worked with Brancusi and was lover, lovers with um, uh, Frida Kalos, and he was this amazing Japanese-American artist. Uh, and I, something, something went off again. It took many years for that to kind of manifest itself as my desire to create something that's not music, uh, but something that's tangible. And these albums, the covers, the, all the videos, all the t-shirts, all the crap, around the band, most of which I really do love. I'm, I'm, I'm being a little facetious to say that I don't like it, but it was all in service to something bigger, and, and I don't think of it really so much as work in and of itself as something that represents a group of people who are trying to do this thing together. The thing with Patty, the thing with Brancusi, was again, through her, another epiphany, and I wanted to do uh, work that, was, that I could hold and touch. Uh, and that, that was the beginning of my uh, idea of, not a career, because I, I didn't even know what a career meant until you asked me to do this, and I, I had to think about it a real lot. And to me, a career involves making money. That's very important, I'm from, you know, from America, so you gotta make money, uh, and that's what a career is. And I looked it up, and it, I, it, it has nothing to do with that. It's actually quite beautiful what they say here, thanks to Apple, an occupation undertaken for a significant period of a person's life and with opportunities for progress. What more could we ask? <laughs> how would you, Hans Ort, to, to, to flip it, how would you define a career before you read that? I was kind of wondering, one thing I was wondering, and that leads us to a question I wanted to ask you both, actually, is this question of, you know, in relation to such a trajectory, how mentorship kind of plays a role, no? Because I think if one looks uh, at history, you know, very often there is a kind of a mentorship, particularly, you know, in the visual art context very often. I mean, uh, I had this very clear situation of having mentors of some sorts. I mean, first of all, I of course, with artists. And when I was a teenager, I would visit, you know, officially by their studio and I would then meet them every couple of weeks and they became kind of my mentor in the art world. And then later, obviously, you know, uh, museum uh, directors like Suzanne Page or Kasper Koenig, where I really, you know, learned from them on the job how to kind of, you know, do an exhibition. So this sort of whole idea of, um, of mentors. And I was kind of wondering if you both had mentors in art, but later then also in music and, and literature. Well, my mentor, other than what Patti Smith, who I just mentioned, is very easy for me because it's Doug. And it was, it was through Doug's, the work that he does not as a writer, which is how we met each other, um, because I was a great admirer of uh, Generation X. But uh, it was not as a writer, but as a, as a sculptor and as a plastic artist that he introduced me to the idea that if you like something and you want to create it, that you can actually manifest that and make it happen. And that was something that seemed impossible to me unless, uh, unless, I, unless I knew how to cut wood or how to use a, um, a, what are those tools called that sculptors use? Chisel. Yeah, like a chisel. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm really clumsy, so I, I can't have stuff like that around. I, I would take my hand off. But you introduced me to the idea that you can cr make things uh, just because you want to. Well, it's kind of cool because it's in your head and suddenly it's out there. It's real. It's quite, yeah. I mean, I just experienced, I think it was 2000, when the phone rang. And, uh, oh, hello, it's Pierre Huy. And, hello, and Wikipedia di didn't exist then. And I'd like to come to Vancouver and do a project. And, like, who's he? And, like, didn't know. And I was very institutionally disengaged back then. And he showed up this incredibly charming French guy, like, I am here, what shall we do? And, and, I, and, and I felt kind of like, you know, Cher getting an Oscar or something, like, wow, like, I get to work with Pierre, and I think I, I was a bit of a novelty with him, I, I, I think, uh, but he opened my eyes to like, oh, there's a larger world out there happening, and then I decided, well, I'm going to use all my brain, I'm tired of just using the verbal cortex, and uh, and then I thought, oh, wait, 1983, best year of your life, just model your life after it. So it, school comes back to it again. I mean, was it a conscious decision? Uh, no, it was entirely organic. And I don't think it's something that you could actually engineer, but maybe we're getting ahead of things. You did a book with Pierre. Out of this came a book. Now, can you tell us about that? Oh, um, I collect high school yearbooks, which is something you don't really have anywhere else in the world, uh, except in Canada and the States. And the reason being, you look through them and you can look at people's faces and like, we can figure out what creates their character. So I had 50 of these and we got out scissors and we chopped out all these photographs that had any sort of emotional content and we restructured them into a story 
that takes the, uh, uh, dead spirits inhabiting a high school in California. And it's very, very haunting and very, very sweet. And I look back on it now. It was just a lovely experience altogether. Now, Michael, you mentioned how uh, the moment when you know, Doug and you, you met, it would be great to hear from both of you a little bit more about this incredible encounter because it happened in very specific circumstances. It happened at the Clinton <laughs> inauguration, no? It was, it was a great moment uh, for America, uh, the end of the Reagan and Bush senior years, and it seemed like we could never, it, you know, it could never get darker than that. Of course, we all now know that it can. Um, but Clinton was being inaugurated, and we had a mutual friend through Jane Pratt, is that correct? But we met at the inauguration. Um, it was actually for I today, I worked at Newsweek, and she's like, oh, look, it's Michael Stipe. And he, she grabbed you, which I know is the absolute worst thing he can do to you. And like, you two should meet. It was like, uh. And I just finished writing a, a story called In the Desert. And I was staying with some friends on Capitol Hill. And I saw the Man in the Moon video for the first time, like an hour, an hour before meeting. It was kind of like, ooh, that's kind of chance. What are, what are the chances of that? And it was just, uh, it's 20 years later. I can't believe it, actually. Yeah, almost uh, 20 years we've known each other. Thanks for mentoring me. <laughs> We're going to get to career advice at the end, just uh, in case anyone is going to ask. But Doug, I wanted to ask you actually if, so 2000 is, the, is an important year in a sense, because in a very crude way, there's a kind of, if we're charting career, non-career, or just your life, there's, a, there's this period of uh, <coughs> visual culture. And then there's, there's the metamorphosizing into a writer, a novelist. Would it be right in thinking that there were voices either in, inside your head or outside your head that, would, that were telling you that in order to be taken seriously as a writer, as a novelist, as an author, you couldn't also make art at the same time. Therefore, there's, the, there's this kind of lost decade from 1990 to 2000 when you're not making um, visual um, material, uh, you're not making art. And then in 2000, in a sense, you decide, whatever, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it all. Um, that's a wall that seems to have come down recently. Uh, that you can only do one thing wall. I mean, I grew up being told, by the time you retire, you're going to have had seven different careers. And I always thought that they were sequential. But the way it seems to be playing out historically, not just for me, but for other people, is that they're all simultaneous careers happening, happening at once. I mean, I studied typography back in the age of letter set, which I'm sure a lot of people here don't even know what it is. And uh, and these days, if you go to work at a magazine, you have to be able to type, you have to know probably in style, you have to know how Macintoshes work, you have to know Photoshop, you have to have these other ancillary skills that used to be specialized. So that even if you're doing one thing, you're still doing five things from the old days. And on top of that, you know, lifetime employment certainly doesn't exist anymore. And uh, I mean, can you be mercenary? Can you plot out a career in, in the art world? I, I don't know if that's possible. I, I mean, you meet some of these young kids and they're like terrifying. I mean, like, wow, maybe they've got it figured out. But I don't know if that's possible to figure it out. Maybe it's still just about chance and following your instincts. Now, there is another parallel reality which uh, you entered more recently, which is uh, design. We were speaking actually with Joseph Grimm about this the other day, about your kind of, you know, venturing into the design world. And you were also mentioning actually last year when we, uh, Talking at the uh, Dubai Fair, you were talking about this idea of you designing furniture. Can you tell us about this new parallel reality? Oh, it's, um, I, I come from British Columbia, Canada, where we have lots of trees and we ship all our trees away. And so it'd be really nice to make something good from here that's made from wood that comes from here. And one of my weird part-time jobs in the 80s was designing baby cribs. And I've actually designed half the baby cribs on planet Earth, but I don't get a percentage of them. And so in a weird way, I became familiar with industrial processes, labor politics, barcoding, industrialized uh, com components. And it just seemed like a very natural, fun thing to do. It just, you know, and why not do it? And Michael, for you, there was uh, an even longer break in terms of, you know, the art, uh, art practice, because you mentioned your early days, very short time you spend in, in art school, and then 
there were decades of you know not making exhibitions and being in the world of music and it's only very recently that you actually started to kind of reconnect to this idea of uh, exhibiting and yeah. then we worked last year on the memory marathon at the Serpentine you told me that was the sort of first art performance you did but yeah. you also did an exhibition can you tell us about this moment the, well yeah the the memory marathon I, I i took on as a challenge because uh, public speaking is the most terrifying thing that i can imagine doing and uh and so of course i had to accept that uh challenge and i i, I did good the um the thing that happened was I, I think i could see the end of uh of music and at the same time for for me and at the same time uh i had had this kind of crazy epiphany about wanting to make things that I could hold in my hand uh, and had subsequently uh, met Doug, became friends. Every time I went to Vancouver, there would be some new amazing thing at his house. And I'd say, like, where did that come from? And he said, well, I made it or I had it made. And it was really inspiring. So he literally kind of walked me through the, the early steps of how to, how to create something. Uh, which, which means that a lot of my really early sculpture work is, is a direct, like this, is a direct homage to, to, Doug, to, to Doug and to his kind of vision. Um, could, you, could we go through maybe? Sure. Of these? Well, these are bronze uh, replicas of cassette tapes. Uh, and uh, I made a giant pile of them and, uh, and, and exhibited. I've only ever had one show. Uh, uh, of note, and uh, I exhibited them uh, in New York in 2008. And these, uh, this is um, uh, camera uh, replicas again, uh, bronze with a silver nitrate finish. And this is nothingness. <laughs> and that's a Polaroid. Also bronze, and this is a piece. Of, uh, this is uh, again after after I, uh, I, 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 I stopped doing music. Uh, I was I wanted to pay homage to the New York Dolls, who were a very influential early uh, uh, heroes of mine from New York, and so I created this piece where um, you, you kind of you get to sit uh, in the in the, in in the chair in front of their first album, which I bought as an eight track. Uh, and, and, and then you have someone take your picture. And that's my studio with um, uh, a life-size uh, American Buffalo, which was a Douglas, uh, direct Douglas uh, cop. Thank you for that. And, uh, and, and then these, these pieces, are, I became obsessed with corners uh, about four years ago, and I photographed them over and over and over again. These are corners from uh, uh, Cor Corbusier's building in, uh, in Marseille. And um, I, 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 I did this cutout and I turned them one revolution to the left. That, that's such a Michael thing to say, like, I'm obsessed with corners. <laughs> I couldn't not look at them for like three years. It was really, it was actually upsetting. I would go to the bathroom and restaurants and take my camera with me. And this is the underneath of, a, you know, those plastic chairs that are everywhere on earth. So this is just a, 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 a this is just a reference shot from the studio. But if you go one forward, I think it makes sense. There's, uh, yeah, that's it. That's one of the first pieces that I did, which is um, uh, the, a cast of the space under my cheap plastic chair, with all apologies to Bruce Nauman. Uh, and here I've just stacked it on, on, a, on a table. This is a book that I did last year, which uh, represented um, my idea of the, the, the giants of the 20th century, which were Marlon Brando, the Concorde, the Dewey Decimal System, and the United Nations. Uh, and there's Marlon Brando with a fake mustache. Looks like Charles Bronson. He looks like, yeah, he looks like Burt Reynolds. <laughs> That's the UN. <clears throat> These are things that just kind of disappeared at, at, at the advent of the 21st century. Doug, could you, you, earlier when we were talking, you uh, said that uh, if Michael makes the, the claim that you came fully formed uh, aesthetically or in terms of the, the universe of, of interest, uh, but then Michael makes a counterclaim, which is where he doesn't uh, have such a recognizable visual lexicon, you would counter that again, wouldn't you? And say that actually there is something about the way, in, like you could tell 
when something is done by Michael, although perhaps it's not as obvious. Image degradation, uh, relationships to brutalistic forms, like architecturally brutalistic forms. Um, there you see it, brutalism, brutalism, brutalism. Uh, it's all there, it really is. I do love, I love brutalism, that's for sure. That's it, that's, that's the studio, it goes on. And, and, and Doug, maybe we could do something uh, similar. Um, when I began doing things, it was quite personal. Those are books, books of my own that I, I chewed up and turned into pulp and then wove into Hornet's Nest, which is to take the books out of historical time and put them into biological time or geological time even. And uh, uh, that was, I did a play at Stratford-on-Avon in England uh, in the mid-2000s. And that was where I started to realize that I was really be becoming obsessed with 9-11 in a lot of ways. And it evolves further as we go through the images here. That was just a scene from the play. Um, okay, Warhol. Every artist has to go through Warhol in the 21st century. Um, I grew up in a very, well, military family and a gun nut family, and my brother's a taxidermist. So I thought, what if you could actually make a taxidermy model of Andy Warhol? And so we made a whole bunch of series of wigs that he would wear from 1966 to 86, uh, 87, and sort of pressed them under glass and then put these gold frames around them like uh, you would see in a natural history museum. And so they're made out of uh, polar bear fur and musk ox and nylon and sort of shamanistic materials. But I think with the wigs uh, connects us also to the first time we ever met. It was Truman called me in London, it was a couple of years ago, so it's very, very urgent that we meet each other and then we had dinner together. Uh, and you um, told us the whole evening about the theory that sort of hairdo, uh, wigs bring us to hairdo, that somehow hairdo is a highway into history. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Theory, because it's something which I think is fascinating. Well, 2,000 years later, who do you remember? Caesar, <coughs> hairdo. Um, well, Einstein, Hitler, Marilyn Monroe, um, Napoleon, anyone who, the Beatles. If you invent a hairdo, it doesn't matter what you do with your life, you're going to be remembered. It's, it's a fact. <laughs> and you told me that about my, ha about my shaved head, which I, 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 I was... I felt very excited about that. I didn't actually invent it, but I was the first person when asked, why did you shave your head? I said, because I was balding. Um, Sinead O'Connor, she beat me to it, but she's a woman from Ireland, so she, she shaved her head for different reasons. Do you, this is, do you think about your hair? Like, how do you think about your hair now? Which is like a very weird... I actually, I, actually, I actually cut it off to come here because I wanted to appear like people might remember me except older. The thing is, like, when, when Michael grows a beard, he becomes invisible. You can go anywhere. It's kind of like it's your shield, in a way. Yeah. Hans, I have a question for you. I mean, art school for us. My impression of you, I remember after the Serpentine event, we were in a room, and you were with people you used to go to, lived in a small apartment with, and you were talking about the good old days. Um, what was your art school, if I can ask that? What, uh, when you, when you get sort of nostalgic or you go back to the, the time and place that made you who you are right now, where was that for you? Yeah, I suppose my art school was studios. You know, I kind of grew up as a teenager visiting artist studios all over Europe. So I would buy like these uh, train tickets where one could sort of, you know, for a month uh, tra travel, you know, on trains. I didn't have, you know, money for hotels. So I would always spend a day in a city and then sleep a bit on the train and get to the next city the next day and visit artist studio. That was kind of my, my art school. Um, before, we're going to open it up very, 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 very soon. Truman, what was your art school? Uh, my art school was doing art at school. Um, a really wonderful and supportive uh, art teacher, which is like the most boring answer, but often the most true for many, many people, I think. And it, it, it proves the fact that one, I'm going to sound like Oprah, but one person can change your life <laughs> at the right time, uh, can really, really change your life. And I think, in, I absolutely agree with, with I mean, in, if, if going to art school was where you went as someone with uh, long hair and a tendency to mumble, I went to the art room at school because I had long hair and a tendency to mumble. So there's something about, uh, and, and, a, and an art teacher that somehow appreciated that. So. 
Um, I'm going to very, very, we're going to open up in very, very quickly. I'm just going to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about career models. And I'm going to mention uh, a few names. And maybe you could just say the first thing that comes to your mind in terms of uh, these people's careers. Um, David Bowie. I think David, if you go to art school, it's like you're just issued a David Bowie ticket. And you just, everyone does that. Um, I remember David Sylvian in Japan and those sort of those quite the haircut groups of the early 80s uh, that went eastward. I th think they were very in influential for me. Um, also in like pop design, like, uh, Memphis I really gravitated towards. Uh, one of the most mind-opening experiences for me, Hans, is sort of to go back a bit, was walking to the Fiorucci flagship store on West 57th in Manhattan on Columbus Day in 1979. It was like, <gasps> And it was like my brain being turned inside out. It was, it was quite shocking. Um, uh, graphic designers, uh, uh, Swiss modernist typographers, it's probably, and of course, Warhol, uh, 1970, looking at the high World Book Encyclopedia. And that was like, there's a soup can. And what the hell is that? And like, oh, and I kind of knew, like, that's it. Yeah, that was pretty fast that way, actually. Uh, Michael, Madonna. She's hardworking. She's she's, hard she, she's written some great songs. Fantastic. She gives great advice. Beyonce. Um, even harder working. She's one of the most amazing. I think I think she's like full on one of the, one of one of one of. A, I'm very proud to be American. And I think. Uh, Morrissey. He's complex. <laughs> <laughs> And um, my last question before we open up for, for a few questions is, um, if, we, if, if money was not the stimulus for either of you in terms of these non-careers that you had, um, looking back now, how, would you, how do you measure success uh, in both of your, not careers, but lives? Satisfaction, just personal satisfaction. I think, I think follow, you follow through with something and you, 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 you make something that you feel really proud of when you go to bed that night. And, uh, and maybe it resonates or maybe you look at it later and go, well, that's not my, I could have done better and that urges you forward to do better. I, money was never a real important thing for me. I was really happy when I didn't have money. Um, and I, I, I was born into a lower middle class family uh, and, and we were extremely happy. So money was never for me. For me, it was more about power. And power is that thing that you, it's, it's not power like I wanna have power over you, but it's like you're drawn like a moth to flame. Sorry for that," uh, said the former lyricist. But you're drawn to <laughs> you're drawn to people who have some charismatic, innate power to them, uh, and, and those are people. You know, I mentioned James Herbert. Uh, Warhol had a certain power, which was probably manufactured to a degree. Uh, you're you're drawn to those people, and 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 that. That, if anything, was m more important to me, to be able to meet those people and be able to hang out with them and learn from them and figure out, like, how did they get to be that cool? Um, okay. You actually met Andy Warhol, and I never got to. And so you got to tell us, how did you meet Andy Warhol? Was that like? He, uh, I, as a teenager, the photographer Todd Eberly, uh, I, I, I dated his best friend, and they would drive up to Athens from Florida. And then Todd went on to become a very successful photographer through Donald Judd and through architectural photography. And in 1986, uh, he dragged me up a flight of stairs uh, in a theater in Manhattan. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was an award show, and Andy Warhol was there. And he pushed me against a wall next to Andy and said, I'm going to take your picture together. And Andy turned to me and said, you're cute. And I said, thank you. I had bleach blonde hair and red eyebrows at the time. I had just come through a very difficult uh, like two-year um, nervous breakdown, uh, a very difficult period for me. And so I, I celebrated that by having red eyebrows. I don't, I, it doesn't make sense even now. But Perfect sense. At the time, it did. He, so he said, you're cute. And I said, thank you. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm a singer in a band. And he said, oh, you're a pop star. And I said, no, I'm a singer in a band. And he said, you're a pop star. And I said, no, I'm a singer in a band. And actually, it was he, again, was kind of prescient because it was within a year of that that my band had our first top 40 hit and a year after that our first top 10 hit. So I kind, I kind of, and then Losing My Religion happened and that took, that took it very global. So he was kind of actually right, I was a pop star.
No, I've seen that picture, and you look 11 years old in it. The great thing about that picture is that I out, I, I am more, uh, I mean, I, I wasn't even sullen then, but I'm so flat and blank that I out Warhol Warhol. Like in the, he looks kind of astonished, and I just look completely. You know, for me, it's like, hello, Mr. Warhol, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> We've um, apparently run out of time. We've got. But we're going to do, I th let's do one or two questions. Um, you should take questions. Please. Over here, Sarah. We need to borrow some mics. Thank you. Thank you. It's been so enjoyable. And um, I wanted to ask, about, thinking back over both of your careers, what role other people's expectations have played in them, whether that's parents, lovers, friends, colleagues, and whether that's in trying to please or trying to reject what they wanted, what they expected. That's a great question. I, I always had the complete and totally loving support of my, my family. Uh, to do what I wanted to do. My father, my, my grandfather, his father, his father, and his father were all Methodist preachers. My father, my father kicked the traces and did not join the ministry, but instead became a helicopter pilot. I really kicked the traces and became, uh, in Andy Warhol's words, a pop star. So I think my father kind of inherently understood my spirit and they just wanted success for me. I always felt very supported by them and I still do. All of my grandparents were minister and great grandparents were Baptist. In, well, this is getting creepy. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, no, my parents had no expectations, whatever. Um, I think we were just like raised like house pets that one day stop sleeping at the house and go somewhere else. And and I look back at the decisions I made in retrospect, and they were just like the worst dis advice you can possibly give your child. You would think is like, you know, start a career as an artist. No become a fiction writer, which is like going from the second worst career option to the, the absolute <laughs> worst. And it, it all kind of worked out in the end. It, my theory has always been, if it feels like homework, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. And it kind of, it's, it'll get you through anything, really. There's one over there. Abbas? Hi. Um, just a quick question. You both um, work with language in a textural sense and in a lyrical sense. And then you work with visual language as well. And I'm just wondering if you find your sense of communication, how they differ when you're you know, dealing with visual language and then singing or writing. Um, and you both have like a kind of a temporal differences, right? You were saying you wrote for a while and didn't make work, and then you didn't make work and sang for a while. And how does it differ for you? I don't know what temporal means. Um, I'll say, for me, writing is about time and visual work is about space. And I think that the most deepest level, what's satisfying is that you can deal with time and space somehow in your brain and that you, like, you, it feels very nourishing in a way. And I mean, th the work I'm doing now, it's probably much more engaged on big, how we think as a species collectively and how we're changing and how it's morphing. So I think time and space is starting to actually fuse together in the work now in a way I find very, you know, really enjoyable. I always regretted uh, that Kurt Cobain died when he did because he was, reaching a point as a lyricist where he was moving through a love of alliteration. Is, is that where, that's where uh, sounds sound alike, right? Uh, and he was moving into what I thought was going to be a very profound uh, period of, of, of writing for him. And then he died, sadly. Uh, I, I feel lucky that I've, I've, number one, I'm 53, I'm so happy to be alive. And to have had the experiences that I've had, I've, I've, I've lived a magnificent life thus far. But I, I feel like I, I feel really lucky that I was able to kind of move through some of the more awkward language periods and actually as a person be able to sit up here on the stage and actually put thoughts together and deliver them in a way that people might find uh, useful or, or arrogant or whatever, you know, whatever you think it is. But that's, that, that was a part of, like language is something that did not come easy for me at all. And I'm, I'm still crazily insecure about my education uh, or how I fit into any, any, any or all. I still feel like the outsider. I'm, so, but language is a very important part of my uh, being able to move through that. Yeah, ju just to follow up quickly, so do you find that like making visual work differs for you or is it better to communicate with than singing and songwriting? That's what I was kind of questioning. Okay, it very much hits a different part of the brain. Music is so, uh, it, it's so much of the heart and Hopefully the work that I do would, would resonate the same way. I mean, those bronze pieces, for instance, 
they're really only exciting when you pick, I mean, I think they're, they photograph beautifully, but they're only really exciting when you pick them up because they weigh a lot. And it's the most unexpected thing to have this cassette in your hand that, that is actually kind of dragging you down. So it makes you think a real lot about what, what that thing is and what we, what we put onto that thing. And last question, and then we have to wrap up. Um, in terms of construction career, uh, consciously or uh, sub subconsciously, uh, I would like to ask the, all of the speakers that did you have any urgent goals in your lives? Uh, to not, to be able to live and work and not have a job. Uh, I, I will say a goal is to, you have ideas and unless you work with them quickly, they can leave you and, and if you stop working with ideas after a while, they never come back. So I just, is always being able to continue getting ideas from wherever they come from and just keeping that chain going because once it stops, it can't start again, I think. Thank you. I became obsessed with the idea of, of a creative community of people with whom I could someday uh, participate and possibly contribute something. So I had to create uh, who I am in order to allow or offer something that would, that would take my profound insecurity and shyness and turn it into something that is perhaps inspiring to cross inspire. One of my goals is to uh, enable kind of uh, unrealized artist dreams to become reality and that leads me actually to a last question I have to ask you both, which is very urgent, which is uh, we've talked a lot about your, you know, parallel realities and all your amazing works in different, in different fields uh, and all the things you've realized, but we haven't talked about your unbuilt roles, we haven't talked about your unrealized projects and I wanted to ask you both to maybe tell us about an unrealized project, particularly dear to you. I mean, there's so many different forms of unrealized project. Projects that have been too big to be realized, too small to be realized. Projects which maybe Doris Lessing told me a couple of years ago there are projects one hasn't dared to do, like self censorship, no? Projects also which have been censored by society or just, you know, unrealizable projects, utopias. What are your unbuilt roads? I have this thing I want to make, it's called the brain. And it's a large room, and it's completely filled volume that you can look through in and around. And there are optical, there are physical, there are all sorts of objects in the space. And it would be the most beautiful place on earth. And it, I think it's maybe, big, it's a little bit bigger than maybe I could do, which is, you know, if you can do it, then why bother? You want to do something that goes a bit further, I think. Uh, so I call it the brain. I recently had uh, another epiphany, which, which happened about three months ago, and the work that I'm doing now sculpturally is, is ho hopefully trying to address that, but it is unrealized at this point. I woke up, uh, I, I, my, my dreamscape is, has always been very, very important to me, and there are people who um, become film uh, directors and writers uh, or artists who, who I think occupy the same place in their dreams as I do, which is that. Uh, the, the landscape is not a frightening one, but it's post-apocalyptic and everything is kind of held together like Beyond Thunderdome or um, the more recent version of um, uh, Total, Total Recall. So that's what it looks like. But I, I woke up out of a dream and uh, realized that I had been dreaming in pixels. And that was, that was a very, for me, a profoundly uh, insane uh, acknowledgement of something that I've been thinking about a real lot, which is how technology, these things, and all of our little devices are changing the way that we see, uh, consciously and unconsciously, uh, see the world that we're moving through. Uh, and, and, then, and then that answers all kinds, that, uh, that opens all kinds of uh, kind of Pandora's boxes of matrix-like Fassbender world of wires questions, uh, which you can, that can really lead you down some K-holes, but, but uh, Responding to that is, for me at this point, unrealized. Okay. Michael Stike, Douglas Copeland, Hans Urkovic, thank you. Thank so you much. all.